He leads the Archdiocese of the Military Services and currently serves as the president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. To talk about the outcome of this week's election and the USCCB statement, please welcome back to the program Archbishop Timothy Broglio. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. Uh, you all issued a statement on behalf of the USCCB, or you did rather, the day after the election. Um, I want to read a little bit of this to you. It reads, yes. I congratulate President-elect Trump as well as the national, state, and local officials who campaign to represent the people. Now we move from campaigning to governing. We rejoice in our ability to transition peacefully from one government to the next. As Christians and as Americans, we have a duty to treat each other with charity, respect, and civility, even if we may disagree on how to carry out matters of public policy. Your Excellency, um, first of all, were you and the bishops concerned that there might be violence or unrest in the wake of this election, and are you concerned now? Well, at the time, you know, that I think that because of the experience four years ago, there was uh, that concern. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that we've always prided ourselves on in this country is the peaceful uh, transition of, of power. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we hope that that continues to be uh, to be the norm. And so that was one of the reasons why uh, the statement uh, uh, praised uh, this this democratic uh, uh, transition. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, what are your priorities going into a second Trump administration for the conference? Well, the priorities of the conference uh, really remain unchanged. Um, there is, of course, the concern for the, the dignity of the human person from uh, the moment of conception until natural death. That remains a preeminent mm -hmm. concern of the bishops. Um, there is also a, a tremendous concern for... Um, uh, the poor in this nation. You know, we are we are a very fortunate nation, and we have many many uh, advantages. And yet, sometimes in our large cities, we see uh, tremendous numbers of of homeless. And we know there are other people who have difficulty uh, making ends meet at the end of each month. And so, uh, we want to be mindful of them and to try and and help them. Um, certainly through charitable outreach, but also through perhaps trying to find solutions to the root problems that uh, that keep people in poverty. Uh, a third concern would be um, trying to reform the uh, migration um, policy or the law of migration in, the, in this country so that um, migration can be orderly, uh, that it be legal, um, and that... Um, that uh, that some of the unrest that we've experienced at the border can can be resolved. And I think coupled with that is a concern for um, the role that the United States plays internationally. And so we should be able to try and address some of the issues that force people to consider uh, leaving their homelands um, mm. to to go elsewhere. Yeah. If we could help resolve some of those problems and, and questions that might be uh, might be another way from from the outside to uh, lessen the, uh, the the tension at the borders. Right. Your Excellency, the Trump administration, as you know, has supported the distribution of abortion pills in the U.S. and uh, the president has this IVF mandate. How will you broach those issues with the new administration? Well, we'll certainly try to continue to reiterate what the church teaches, um, that, um, you know, that uh, the unborn child in the womb has a right uh, to live, has a right to be born, um, and that um, conception should be, should be the result of the natural union between uh, husband and wife. Um, and so... Um, IVF really isn't isn't a solution. We'll try to continue to present uh, that teaching, um, in in the hopes that we'll find some some receptive ears in uh, in the new administration. Archbishop, a sizable majority of Catholics, as you know, voted for President Trump this time, fifty six percent, according to some exit polls. Why do you think Catholic voters broke for him in those numbers as opposed to twenty twenty? 
Well, I think probably there are probably a a, a number of reasons, and I suppose uh, you'd almost have to talk to an a, an expert in electoral analysis to uh, to get a good answer. But I would think certainly. Um, our preeminent concern for the dignity of the human person is one thing that would have influenced those voters. I think also mm -hmm. um, people are uncertain of the economy. I think that would be a, another uh, factor. Yeah. Um, and I think also, um, you know, in a very real sense, um, uh, Catholics have seen what uh, the first Trump administration did to uh, um, to support uh, human life, and I, I think maybe there is a that would certainly be a an, an in, yeah. a, fa a factor that influences as well. Well, and he also had he conveyed an openness to at least religious exemptions on some of these issues that you know Catholics might find uh, abhorrent. That when when Kamala Harris was asked, would you have any exemptions to abortion? She said, no, absolutely no religious exemptions at all. And I think that was kind of a determining factor here, certainly with the Catholic vote. I would agree with you there. The fact that there was no no space for any uh, freedom of conscience, I think that was uh, that was certainly a deciding factor. And also, uh, in a very real sense, um, uh, Vice President Harris had made uh, the 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 right to abortion almost the the central issue of the of the campaign. And I think that yeah. would be very dissuading to to many many Catholics. Hmm. Your Excellency, I want to move for a second to talk about the Synod. The final document of that Synod said the question of a female diaconate remains an open question. Now, this has gone back and forth. The Pope said no, and then they had a study group, and then uh, Cardinal Fernandez came out and said uh, they're, they're, they were looking into it, but it was a closed question. And now the final Synod document said it's an open question. What was your reaction when you saw that? Well, uh, I was very surprised to see it. And of course, as you probably know, it received the largest number of negative votes, that uh, that number of the final document. And I think that's because uh, many, many of the participants in the Synod uh, felt that it was not uh, an issue that was really um, uh, that was still open. Um, I, I think both uh, St. John Paul II and, and also Pope Francis have made it very clear that uh, um, that this is not an open question. And so I think there was uh, there was almost surprise to see uh, that issue mm. um, classified as still being open in the in the Senate document. Yeah. Your Excellency, you made headlines last week when you said that involving laity in diocesan-level decision-making would be critical to implementing the synod recommendations. You said, quote, there was a feeling that there should be a certain regularity to gatherings. So perhaps that would be a way to invite people to participate more directly in the life of the church, and especially in the notion of decision-making and walking together. Um, Archbishop, what does that mean practically? Well, I think it means, of course, in this country, uh, the bodies that uh, that are used for consultation in the church function, uh, which is not true mm -hmm. universally. But, you know, we do have wow. diocesan pastoral councils. We do have presbyteral councils. Uh, <laughs> certainly we have mm -hmm. finance councils. Um, and so uh, those organizations do... Um, you know, do participate in in the decision making process, um, and I think we have to make a decision too. Uh, we have to make a distinction between decision making and decision taking, because there are obviously some questions mm. that uh, that fall on the bishop's shoulders. Um, he listens to the advice, but then he he has to make a decision. Um, and so, uh, I think though, what we would hope is is that. Uh, um, these bodies could be even more representative of of the people uh, that that we serve mm -hmm. in the church, and that um, they would have more opportunities to to let their voices their let their voices be heard. It's still um, a little bit of a dilemma to me that with all of the preparations that we made for the synod, less than one percent of Catholics in the United States actively participated in the meetings that were that were held, and so. Um, the door was wide open, but, you know, we, we didn't go out and force people to come in. And maybe <laughs> maybe we have to find a better way to, to open the door. That I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think there's a—I think certainly in the American context, maybe in the European as well, there, 
there is still the idea that, you know, the sheep are awaiting the leadership from the shepherd, not the other way around. And I do think um, there, you know, and, and those roles can get confused in some of the conversations around the synod. But I, I want to ask you one question about this, this idea of synodality, the meaning of that word. Cardinal Burke was with us last week and said, to his mind, it, it, it remains undefined. Is the term synodality defined in your mind? Well, that was one of the things that we actually asked at the at the very beginning of uh, the discussions in the in this part two of the synod was to come up with a good definition of synodality, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we we still need to work on that. Um, I would say though that it is. Um, <laughs> It's much more than um, than just simply, um, you know, gathering together and, and hearing opinions. It's much more of a mm -hmm. uh, a gathering, invoking the Holy Spirit, um, and then trying to to hear what the Spirit is saying, and also at the same time. Um, listening to uh, perhaps uh, his voice as, as expressed in, in those that are gathered together. But I realize that's still a very, very nebulous uh, process. Um, yeah. But I would, I would think that it's very important to emphasize um, the notion of prayer in this whole process. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply but, an but exchange I... of opinions. It's also yeah. a, a listening to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Archbishop, I think this is where, you know, from the lay perspective, my goodness, I could read you some of the emails I get. Because people are just confused because when they heard the term synod, certainly throughout my whole life, a synod is when bishops got together and prayed and, and, and shared their informed spiritual opinions with one another, not laity and, frankly, uninformed young people and non-Catholics coming together. And so th I, 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 th that, that notion of a synod has been transformed, it seems, in the last few years, no? I think I think that is true. Uh, and they, they insisted on referring to it as the Synod of Bishops, and yet there were um, about a third of the people who were lay people um, or, or priests and, and not bishops, and then they all had a vote. So it, 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 there's, there is definitely a, a much wider understanding here than what we're accustomed to. Yeah, well, we shall keep our eyes on it in the days ahead. Archbishop Timothy Broglio, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. You're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity.